Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video, we're going to introduce Unit 5 of the course on eigenvalue problems. Eigenvalue problems are very important in many areas of science and engineering, and here we're going to look at a few motivating examples of how we can use eigenvalue problems to analyze resonances in structures and also look at the properties of graph networks. We'll also look at some of the basic commands we can use in Python for calculating eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Suppose we have an n by n matrix A with complex entries. Then we can say that A has eigenpairs lambda 1 v1 up to lambda n vn, such that A times vi is equal to lambda i times vi for all i. And here we say that the lambda i are the eigenvalues and the vi are the corresponding eigenvectors. And it's remarkable how important eigenvalues and eigenvectors are in many areas of science and engineering. For example, eigenvalues and eigenvectors are closely related to the phenomenon of resonance that we see in many different situations. If we look at the oscillations of pendulums or the natural vibrations of structures or of musical instruments, then we find that we can explain these using resonance. And resonance is also crucial for several technologies such as lasers and nuclear magnetic resonance. And to illustrate resonance, let's now look at a spring connected to a mass M. And let's suppose that the mass's vertical displacement is given by Y of T, where T is time. And let's suppose that the spring satisfies Hooke's law so that the force F of T is equal to K times Y of T, where K is the spring constant. And let's also suppose that we apply a periodic forcing R of T to the mass. If we now apply Newton's second law, then we obtain the ODE Y double prime of T plus K divided by M times Y of T is equal to R of T. And here we put that our forcing function R of t is equal to F0 times cosine omega t. And we can recall that the solution to a non-homogeneous ODE like this can be written as the sum of a homogeneous solution, yh of t, where we set the right-hand side to 0, and a particular solution, yp of t, where we solve the full equation. And let's now put that omega 0 is equal to the square root of k divided by m. Then, if omega is not equal to omega 0, then we can write that our solution, y of t, is equal to yh of t plus yp of t. And here, yh of t is equal to c times cosine omega 0 t minus delta, where c and delta are free parameters. And our particular solution, yp of t, is equal to f0 times cosine omega t divided by m times omega 0 squared minus omega squared. And let's now look at the amplitude of our particular solution, which is given by F0 divided by M times omega 0 squared minus omega squared. And if we plot this amplitude, then we see that there is singular behavior when omega approaches omega 0. In other words, when the forcing frequency that we apply matches the natural frequency of oscillation of the mass. For this particular case, when omega equals omega zero, we can solve the ODE as a special case, and we find that here, yp of t can be written as f zero divided by two times m times omega zero times t times sine omega zero t. And we see that we have this additional factor of t in the solution in this case. And if we plot the particular solution, then we find that the oscillations will grow without limit. And this is the phenomenon of resonance. So by forcing a system at its natural frequency, then we can make these oscillations grow without limit. Now, this is a mathematically idealized case where we don't have any damping term. If we applied a damping term, then that would limit the size of the oscillations that could grow. However, without this damping term, then the size of the oscillations will be unbounded. 
In general, omega zero is the frequency at which the unforced system has a non-zero oscillatory solution. And for the single spring mass system, we can substitute the oscillatory solution, y of t, which is equal to x times e to the i omega zero t, into the ODE to obtain the scalar equation, k times x is equal to omega zero squared times m times x. And from here, we can obtain that omega zero is equal to the square root of k divided by m, and that precisely matches the definition that we made use of when we solved the original ODE. And if we look at this scalar equation, we can see that it has some similarity to the definition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. If we associate x here with being an eigenvector and omega zero squared with being an eigenvalue. And to see this connection more clearly, we'll now look at composite spring mass systems with multiple components. So let's now consider a three component system with masses m1, m2, and m3 that are connected together with springs with spring constants k1, k2, and k3 as shown in the diagram. And let's define y1, y2, and y3 to be the vertical displacements of the three masses. And we can introduce a three component vector y of t that describes the state of the system. And in the unforced case, this system will satisfy the ODE, m y dual prime of t plus k y of t is equal to zero. And here m is the mass matrix, which is a diagonal matrix with entries m1, m2, and m3 on the diagonal. And k is the stiffness matrix. And the entries of k can be given by considering the extensions of the three springs between the masses. And that will have terms that are shown here. And we can again seek a non-zero oscillatory solution to this ODE. And to do this, we put that y of t is equal to x e to the i omega t, where y and x are three component vectors. And this will give us the algebraic equation kx is equal to omega squared mx. And if we now said that a is equal to m inverse k and lambda is equal to omega squared, then this will give us an eigenvalue problem, a times x is equal to lambda x. And here then, a is a three by three matrix. And we can obtain natural frequencies of our system from the three eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. So in this case, we have that rather than just having a single natural frequency, our three component system can have three different frequencies at which its components will oscillate. This type of analysis is very important in engineering and suppose that we were trying to design a structure like a house or a bridge, then we could discretize that structure into many mass components connected by spring elements. And if we performed an eigenvalue analysis on the resulting discretized system, then we could determine the natural frequencies at which our structure would like to oscillate. And we might like to ensure that any forcing frequencies that are applied to our structure do not match those natural frequencies. Otherwise, we might encounter resonance and our structure might start to oscillate undesirably. And this has been encountered in a number of engineering projects. And one example is the Millennium Footbridge in London. And this bridge makes use of a unique low strung cable design and when the bridge first opened, uh, it was realized that one of the natural frequencies of the bridge was actually similar to the typical frequency at which pedestrians would walk. And this caused the bridge to oscillate from side to side undesirably. And this actually required a number of engineering fixes to dampen out this oscillatory mode. The spring mass systems that we've considered so far contain discrete components, but the same ideas can also hold for continuum models. And as an example, let's look at the wave equation to describe oscillations on a 1D string or a 2D drum. And here we have the equation d squared u by dt squared minus c times the Laplacian of u is equal to zero. And here u represents the vertical displacement of our string or drum surface. And following the same procedure as before, we can write that our solution u of x and t is equal to u tilde of x times 
a oscillatory term e to the i omega t and by substituting this in we obtain minus the Laplacian of u tilde is equal to omega squared divided by c times u tilde and this is a PDE eigenvalue problem. We can discretize the Laplacian operator using finite differences to obtain an algebraic eigenvalue problem a times v is equal to lambda v and here the eigenvalue lambda is equal to omega squared over c and will give us a natural vibration frequency of the system. And here v is the eigenvector if we think of it in a discrete sense and we also call this the eigenmode if we think of it in the continuum sense and this will give us the corresponding vibration mode of the system. And both Python and MATLAB contain library functions for computing eigenvalues and eigenvectors and they actually share the same names. So both languages have a function called eig that can compute all eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a dense matrix and both languages have a function called eigs that can find a few eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a sparse matrix. And in this unit we're going to look at the algorithms behind eig and eigs. And we'll now look at a Python demo to demonstrate this library functionality where we find the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenmodes for the Laplacian on the unit square with zero Dirichlet boundary conditions. Let's now take a look at the program squareig.py that demonstrates Python's routines for calculating eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And in this program, we're going to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Laplacian operator on the unit square using zero Dirichlet boundary conditions. And we're going to discretize the interior of the square using an m by m grid of points shown by the purple circles in this diagram. And we'll pad this grid on all sides by one layer of points shown by the red circles on the boundary of the domain where we apply our zero Dirichlet boundary condition. And this will therefore give us a grid spacing of h which is equal to 1 divided by m plus 1. If we now look at the program then we begin by importing a number of different Python modules. In particular we'll import the sparse linear algebra module from SciPy that gives us the eigenvalue computation routine. In this example we'll make use of m equal 40 and that will give us 40 squared total interior grid points to solve for and we'll define our grid spacing. We'll then create the center difference differentiation matrix that represents the Laplacian on the unit square and this will be a sparse matrix and it will have five non-zero diagonals corresponding to the five-point stencil for the Laplacian at each point. And we'll first define three vectors, CEN, HOR, VER, that define the terms along the different diagonals in our differentiation matrix. And we'll then use the diag-s function that can take those vectors of terms and assemble them into a sparse matrix where those terms are placed along different diagonals. So here we have the five different diagonals, the central terms, and then terms corresponding to horizontal neighbors of each point and vertical neighbors of each point. And they will have offsets of zero for our central term 1 and minus 1 for our horizontal neighbors and m and minus m for our vertical neighbors. And once we've created this sparse matrix D2 then we'll call the eigs function that can compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So we'll pass in D2, we'll also pass in 8 because we want to calculate 8 eigenvalues and eigenvectors and then we can also pass in a keyword of sm which tells the function that we want the eigenvalues with smallest magnitude 
And there are different options that we could provide here. For example, LM would return the eigenvalues with largest magnitude. And we'll then go ahead and print these eigenvalues. After this, we're now going to plot one of the eigenvectors that we found. And we're going to do this by creating an n plus 2 by n plus 2 array that represents our entire grid, including the boundary grid points. And we'll copy the contents of one of the eigenvectors into the central m by m grid points in this domain. And in general, the eigenvalue and eigenvector computation can be complex, and it will return complex values. And therefore, in this copying function, we actually make use of a cast to real values. However, in this situation, since we're dealing with a symmetric matrix, then we know that our eigenvectors will indeed be real and orthogonal. We'll then plot the eigenvector using a 3D plot in matplotlib. So let me now go ahead and run this program. So we first see that it prints out the eigenvalues that it's found, and these are returned as complex numbers, even though we see that the imaginary parts are zero in this case, as we would expect. And if we now look at the zeroth eigenvector, which would correspond to the eigenvalue of 19.72, 955 here, then we see that we have this function shown here, where we have this peak in the center of the domain that satisfies our zero Dirichlet boundary condition on all sides. So let's now look at running this program and plotting out a different eigenvector. And we can see here that even though this function returns eight eigenvalues, they're not actually sorted internally in terms of their magnitude. And suppose now we wanted to look at the next largest eigenvalue of size 49 that is indexed by two in our array. So let me now change this zero here to a two. And in this case, we now see that we have this double peak structure where we have one positive peak and then one negative peak. And we'll now look in more detail at the range of eigenvectors that we get for this problem. In our example, we found the eigenmodes of the Laplacian operator. And here I'm showing the six eigenmodes corresponding to the six smallest eigenvalues. Let's now return to our 2D wave equation example that models the vibrations of a drum surface. And so each one of these eigenmodes that we see here would correspond to a different way in which the drum surface would oscillate, each with a characteristic frequency corresponding to the eigenvalue. For example, if we look in the top left, then this corresponds to the fundamental mode by which the drum can oscillate, where the whole surface will just move backward and forward. And the other eigenmodes correspond to more complicated ways in which the drum surface can oscillate. And suppose now that we struck the drum surface, then what would happen is that we would excite a combination of different eigenmodes by which the drum can vibrate. And each one of those modes would oscillate with its own characteristic frequency, and our solution would just be a linear combination of those different eigenmodes. And the sound that we would hear from the drum would actually correspond in some way to that set of frequencies by which the drum can oscillate. And it's worth noting that in this example, there are actually some repeated eigenvalues. And here, our numerical routine 
will actually just return back various linearly independent members of the corresponding eigenspace. So, for example, if we look at lambda equal 49.3, then we will get back eigenvectors that are in the eigenspace spanned by this function here, where we have two free parameters, alpha 1, 2, and alpha 2, 1, that each have a corresponding product of sine terms. We can use the same methods to compute the eigenmodes for different shaped domains. And here I'm showing six eigenmodes for an L-shaped domain. And the lowest frequency eigenmode, shown in the top left, corresponds again to a vibration where the entire surface of the drum would oscillate backwards and forwards. And the next set of eigenmodes correspond to more complicated oscillations of the drum surface. And a well-known mathematical question that was posed by Mark Katz in 1966 is, can one hear the shape of a drum? And the eigenvalues of a shape in 2D correspond to the resonant frequencies that the drum would oscillate at. And therefore, the eigenvalues determine the harmonics, or essentially the sound, that we would hear from the drum. So in mathematical terms, Katz's question is basically, if we know all of the eigenvalues, can we uniquely determine the shape of the drum? And it turns out that the answer to this question is no. And in 1992, Gordon, Webb and Wolpert constructed two different 2D shapes that have exactly the same eigenvalues. And I'm showing these two shapes here. And we can compute the eigenvalues and eigenmodes of the Laplacian on these two shapes using the algorithms that we'll study in this unit. And if we look at the first five eigenvalues for the two drums, then we find that they exactly agree. And we can now look at the corresponding eigenmodes. So the first eigenmode corresponding to the fundamental frequency again corresponds to a oscillation where on both drums the entire surface will oscillate backwards and forwards. Let's now look at eigenmode 2, where we start to see more complicated oscillations of the drum surfaces. Let's now look at eigenmode 3, eigenmode 4, and eigenmode 5. And so we'll now finish this video by looking at a different example where eigenvalues and eigenvectors can be used. And we'll see that they can also be used to analyze properties of graph networks. Let's now look at a different example where eigenvalues and eigenvectors turn out to be useful. And we're going to look at analyzing the properties of social networks. And here I'm showing a small graph with eight nodes. And I'm thinking of the nodes as representing different people. And the edges here represent different friendship connections between the people. And these could be self-reported, or if we wanted to do this on a larger scale, then we could gather this data from online sources, for example, Facebook friends or Twitter connections. Now, suppose we wanted to mathematically analyze this network then one way to begin this would be to look at the connectivity between the different people. So we could look at assembling a grid of all of the connections between people, and we could put ones in the locations where two people are connected. So for example, person three and person four are connected with an edge, and we could therefore put a 1 in the 3, 4, and 4, 3 positions in this grid. And we could fill in the rest of the grid with zeros. And this defines a very common tool in analyzing graphs referred to as the adjacency matrix that can describe all of the connections between different nodes in a graph. So suppose we wanted to analyze this social network. 
then one question we could ask is how important are the different people in the network? And we could write that VI is the importance of person I. And we could ask ourselves, how could we define importance? And one way to think of importance is to define it as being proportional to the sum of the importances of friends. So you may think that a person is important if they have many important connections. And that would lead us to this definition. We could say that the importance of person I, VI, is proportional to the sum from j equal 1 to 8 of Aij, the ijth component of our adjacency matrix, multiplied by Vj. And this actually leads to an eigenvalue problem. And we could introduce a eight component vector V, and we could introduce a constant of proportionality into the equation. And after rearranging, we end up with the standard form of our eigenvalue problem, A times V is equal to lambda times V. And if we calculate then the eigenvalue and eigenvector spectrum, we'll get eight different eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And let's choose the one corresponding to the largest eigenvalue, which works out to be 2.447. The corresponding eigenvector for this case is shown here, and we can transfer these numbers onto the graph. And we can see that this makes some sense. If we look at nodes 1, 2, and 3, then these have low components in our eigenvector. And that would mean that these people are less important in the network since they only have one connection to someone else. We can see that the most important people in the network are 4, 5, and 7. And in particular, we see that person 5 is the most important in this network. And it's worth noting here that even though person 5 only has three connections, they work out as more important than person 4 because their three connections are all to other important people, whereas person 4 has several connections to the less important people 1, 2, and 3. So in this analysis, we made this choice to look at the largest eigenvalue. And the other eigenvectors actually can be used to highlight different structures in the graph. And suppose we look at the next largest eigenvalue, which works out to be 1.638. Then the corresponding eigenvector actually divides the nodes into two clusters based on the signs of the eigenvector components. And we find that nodes 1, 2, 3, and 4 have a negative component in this eigenvector, and nodes 5, 6, 7, and 8 have a positive component in this eigenvector. And we can see that this is the most natural way to split this network into two components. And this could be a very powerful tool for analyzing networks, and we can use this as a way to identify local clusters of connected people. And there's a lot more that could be said on this subject, and if you're interested in this, then I recommend the book Networks, an Introduction by Mark Newman that was published in 2010.